I, I titled this, uh, <coughs> this session, A Discordant Voice in Eden. Um, I'm not sure why exactly, but I, that's, that's what I, I... I was looking for titles for all, this, all, the, all the sections that had uh, the word word in it. And uh, Eden, of course, speaks to us of the beginnings. It speaks to us of creation. And uh, we looked at John's prologue this morning uh, and the, the sense of creation by God's word, creation as somehow God's self-expression. When we talk about Eden, we start to think of Adam and Eve, we start to think of trees, we start to think of snakes that talk. And there's a risk in that that we are reducing the size, if you like, we're reducing the scale of creation down to something manageable. The story of the first human beings uh, and their relationship with God in Genesis, or the two versions of the story, uh, particularly the second version that starts uh, in the second chapter of Genesis, makes it seem as though the scale of creation, and particularly the scale of human creation, is, is very limited. It's manageable. There's a garden in the east. There are rivers, and some of them we know the names of. It makes the story of creation uh, a microcosm. But in a sense, that also reduces the, the scale of God. And it may once have been possible uh, in, um, when, we, when we thought of the earth as the center of the universe, it may once have been possible to conceive of creation in that way. But now that we know so much more about the universe and the enormous scale of the universe, both in terms of extent and in terms of time, we can't allow ourselves to continue to think of creation simply in this kind of domesticated garden setting. We really need to allow God, if you like, to break out of that picture of Eden that we have. There's a wonderful book <coughs> which for many years I described to people as the best book of theology I'd read probably ever. I think I've read some better ones since, but it's still a good one. It's called A Big Enough God. Uh, those of you from, from uh, Great Britain may know the author, uh, Sarah Maitland, a wonderful, a wonderful author, novelist, uh, spiritual writer, uh, meditator, I think, uh, a woman who went and, and lived on her own in silence, wrote a book about being in silence. But Sarah Maitland's wonderful book <coughs> is called A Big Enough God. And she says that we have not a concept of God big enough to take in all that we know about the world from observing the world. Now the Quran is very insistent constantly that what we see around us in creation is an ayah, is a sign. What we see around us in creation tells us something about God. Now if we constrict our sense of the world to some domesticated garden somewhere over in the east, then we are not taking full account of what the universe is saying to us about God. Do we have an image of God that is big enough to include the fact of the billions of years uh, during which our universe has existed? Do we have a concept of God which is big enough, wild enough almost, to take account of the, <coughs> of the fact of the, uh, the enormous complexity of the world, 
Do we have a concept of God which is big enough to deal with the, with the chance and the chaos that we know exists? Do we have a vision of God which is big enough to take in all the myriad possibilities that we now know exist, whereas before we had a very domesticated view of God in which everything was run pretty much like our childhood household. Pardon me, I'm just going to have a good cough. I'll turn myself off. <coughs> and then I'm going to have a fisherman's friend. So, <clears throat> so a big enough, oop, a big enough. No, the other pocket is that one. <laughs> <clears throat> so the question for us, and it's a question which is posed to us also uh, by Muslims very often, who who find a way of reading the Quran. Uh, which is much more abundant in its, in its view of creation uh, against some Christian readings of, the, of Genesis which, is, which are very constricted and limited uh, and we all know what we're talking about particularly here in the US. So, that's all right, it's okay. <laughs> you people can't help it, you, you overthrew legitimate royal authority once, and you've been suffering for it ever since. <clears throat> so our concept of, of creation uh, has to take in all that we know now about our universe and, and this expands the notion of God that we have. It expands the notion of God from someone who's just above the clouds or someone who's just walking in the garden into someone who is who is in fact someone who just is someone who is not somewhere someone who is not just some time but someone who just is who is not simply in our space but who envelops the whole of, of space and for whom the whole of the universe is something of a self-expression. So when I focus at the moment on Eden, I don't want, it, want us to get lost back in our small view of God. When uh, Rowan Williams often talks about a line which I think he picked up from the Dalai Lama, <clears throat> he says, at the heart of the universe, there is a great sigh of compassion. At the heart of our universe, there is a great sigh of compassion. And that is what we mean by God. We are not talking about one of the things in the universe, one of the people in the universe, the biggest person in the universe, the most powerful person in the universe, the oldest person in the universe, the strongest person in the universe. God is not one of the things or one of the people <coughs> in the universe. God just is. Now God has, as we saw this morning in John, God has, by his own self-expression, given rise to this wild universe, which eventually, after billions of years, and many false starts perhaps, has given rise to us. There has been an evolution towards creatures like ourselves who can love. The Christian tradition would want to say that the most, the closest we can get to the understanding of God is the love the two people have for one another when they are fully committed, when they become one. 
our universe has evolved to the point, it may evolve further, but our universe has evolved to the point where we can express the very being of God. This is what God has been hoping for. This is what God has been waiting for, working for, to bring the universe to the point where it can express and act on and live in love. And that means that we, in our own way, are creative. And that's our trouble. We are, we are part of creation. We are made exactly of the same stuff as the sun and the moon and the stars and the, the galaxies. We're made of the same energies, the same fundamental particles. We are, as someone once said, probably said more than once, we are made of stardust. And it's true. We are made of stardust. And so we are utterly created. We are just as created as anything else. And yet the thing that sets human beings apart, <coughs> not completely apart, but the thing that distinguishes human beings from other creation is that we are creative. And that is our problem. We are trying to be creative creatures. Nobody else has that problem. God doesn't have that problem because God is only creative. God is not created. The rest of creation doesn't have that problem because the rest of creation is, as far as we can ascertain, not really creative in the same sense that human beings are creative. We know that animals build things. We know that bees build combs and they make honey and so on, but we always know how they will do this. There's not some bee who suddenly says, wouldn't it be better if we did it this way? Let's rethink the hexagon. Uh, Let's, you know, we, we could, if we brought that over here, then we could put this over there and we could air condition the thing and it would save the... <clears throat> this doesn't happen. Other creatures are productive, other creatures are, uh, play a great role, but other creatures don't have our creativity. That is to say, other creatures don't seem to have the ability to shape situations. They don't seem to have the ability to, to take a look at the situation and say, we will change this. We'll build a college here. We'll put a chapel right here. Chapel's only used on Sundays. Okay, let's make it an auditorium as well. Well, we've got all these bricks up. Let's put some faculty offices here too. <clears throat> Creativity, it's simply the ability to shape our situation. Now, our creativity is limited, of course. We, there are lots of things we can't shape. We can only shape the world in very uh, restricted ways. Wonderful in all sorts of ways. But when you think about <clears throat> perhaps the most, the boldest thing we've ever done as human beings, from one point of view, uh, would be to go to the moon. Well, okay, we've gone to the moon, but it didn't change the universe that much. It changed things on Earth somewhat, but still Earth is a tiny little corner of an out-of-the-way galaxy, and uh, it's just almost nothing. So that's us, creatures made of stardust, made like the rest of creation, dependent, not self-subsisting, and creative. Now the trick to being human is to learn to be those two things together. The trick to being human is to accept both our createdness, our being part of all of creation, our being one with the rest of the universe, and at the same time to take our responsibility to shape situations, 
to respond to need, to adjust the way we live in order to acknowledge our oneness with the rest of creation. But it's a very tall order to keep these two things together. And that really is where our trouble started. <clears throat> That's what we see going on in the story uh, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden are, are told they're blessed. They, God wants nothing more for them than, it, it's wonderful little scene, uh, an image of God wanting to, to walk with the human beings in the cool of evening. They want, God wants nothing better than the companionship from these creatures and their, their place in tilling the soil and bringing forth fruit. And yet there's something about these two that makes them more prepared to listen to the talking snake than to listen to the voice of God. Genesis doesn't explain the origins of evil. It doesn't explain the origins of sin. It simply dramatizes these two people representative of, of humanity. It dramatizes them doing what we all know we do. That is to say, we distrust the Word of God. We distrust the Word of God that simply says, I just, I love you. I just want to be with you. I, 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 don't, I don't have any ulterior motive. I'm not playing games with you. I simply want to live in peace with you. I want you to flourish. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to, I want you to live. Somehow that voice doesn't, doesn't ring true to us. There's something about us that makes us want to listen to a talking snake who says God is trying to cheat you out of something. Genesis doesn't explain why it is so, but it simply observes something that we all know. This terrible sense that we can't trust God. And a lot of our theological language or a lot of our preaching language seems to reinforce this sense. Oh yes, the unknowable ways of God. You know. Oh yes, you got cancer. Well, you know, God has his plan for you. you know, God's playing a game with you. Uh, God's doing this to you because you did that to somebody else, or you didn't do that, so therefore God's doing this. You'll never know what it is because God's ways are not our ways. We talk about God as though God is utterly untrustworthy, as though God simply is playing with us. And yet the New Testament says to us, no, God is not like that. In God there is no darkness. There's only light. There is nothing hidden. It is only positive. Paul says in God, it's, I think it's Paul, might be John, one of those two. Uh, I told you I wasn't a theologian. <clears throat> he says in God, it's, there's not yes and no. There's only yes in God. In God, there's not light and darkness, there's only light. And yet, for some reason, we are prepared to listen to the voice wherever it comes from that says to us, God is trying to teach you out of something. You could be more than you are, but God is trying to keep you down. God is, God is preventing you from coming to your fullness. This is what the talking snake says. Oh yes, God said to you, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, you know what the, the reason for that is, because God knows very well if you eat that fruit, you will be like God. If you eat that fruit, says the talking snake, you will determine what is good and what is evil. You will decide, you will just be creators. You can give up being creatures, you can give up having to live in relationship with the rest of creation, and you'll just be creators like God. 
You'll be giving out commandments right and left. You'll be deciding and determining and saying what's what to who and who. That's what we want to hear. That's the voice somehow that's more convincing. Because we, we have difficulty holding this creativeness and creativity together. We'd much rather just be creators. We'd much rather just be God. <clears throat> I'd much rather just be God, wouldn't you? We would much rather just be God, or on, on our worst days when being God seems like too much trouble, we'd much rather simply be a cow. Let's say a cow. All you've got to do is eat grass, if you want. You could just stand there, there's nothing much else to do. No responsibilities, no email to check, no crying babies to change their diapers, none of that sort of thing, no, no dinner to prepare, no shopping to do, no bills to pay, just a creature. So we'd rather go one way or the other. Mostly we want to be God, but other days when we're not feeling quite up to it, we're happy enough to be a, a cow. How to bring these two things together? How to live true humanity, which is to say, to accept creativeness and to live creativity. How to keep these in balance? That's the issue that we know is very fundamental to us. That's why we tell the story, have told the story for centuries of our first parents in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't explain anything, but it's, it's one of those stories that expresses something we know is fundamentally true about ourselves. That there's something in us that would rather listen to the voice that says, do not trust God. God is trying to cheat you out of something. Everything God asks of you, everything, every limitation that's placed on you as a creature is simply an injustice. It's simply not respecting who you are. And you can escape from that. And we all want to. And that really is what we call original sin. That sense we have, there's no evil involved, right? The, the, uh, I think in, in, in trying to understand what original sin is, we, we really need to avoid uh, dualism. We need avo to avoid having a bad God or a bad power and a good power, the bad power that is responsible for evil and the good power who is God. Sin emerges out of two good things, strangely, and the inability we have of keeping them in balance. Sin is a refusal of our creativity, perhaps, or on the other hand, it's a refusal of our creatureliness and our relatedness to the rest of creation. One or the other. Think about it. Think of our, our current climate crisis. Think about how we have decided we will be creators. We will build Detroit, we'll build all these motor cars, and we'll build bigger and bigger engines, and pump more and more oil, and make more and more gas, and we will refuse to have any limitations on our emissions. And anyone who is, who is saying to you, no, you should uh, reduce carbon emissions, they're, they're infringing on your liberty, your liberty to make money, your, your creativity to build bigger and better engines. We, we, we are insisting on our unbridled creativity. We can create what we want, we can do what we want, we can have as many cars and pump as much gas as we want. We can cool our chapels to frigid extents. <laughs> we can heat our, our houses so that in winter we, we have to only go around in a t-shirt and shorts. 
we don't care because we can do it. We are creators. But in this very crisis, we are seeing our refusal of our creaturehood. We are refusing, we're seeing the results of our refusal to recognize that we are part of this whole ecosystem. We are one with nature. We're not above it. We are not God. We will poison ourselves. We are poisoning the earth. And if we're poisoning the earth, we're poisoning ourselves. Sin is, on the one hand, simply asserting our creativity and our ability and our freedom and our right and to hell with everything else to do these things. Or on the other hand, it is simply being a creature. You see someone who's fallen over outside the Safeway, shopping bags everywhere. This person has a walker. He's not, he's not too steady on his legs. He's fallen over. Of course, if a cat walks past, I don't like cats, I'm afraid to say, but <clears throat> if a do even if a dog walks past, a dog will at least give him the time of day. But if a, if a dog walks past, unless the dog is lassie, you don't expect that the dog is going to be able to take the situation in hand and help this guy out. But if you or I walk past with no more attention to the man on the ground than a dog or a cat, then we are simply being creatures. We are refusing the responsibility that comes from our creativity, which is to say we have an ability to shape that situation. Does an ambulance need to be called? Has the man had a stroke? We have the ability to think through these things. We have the simple ability to pick the guy up, to make sure that the shopping is there, maybe to put him out in our car, take him home. That's creativity. To, to recognize our creativity and our createdness together, that is that is the key to, to the rich human life. But to insist simply on unbridled creativity with, which takes no notice of our insertedness our, uh, in the rest of creation, that is sin. To refuse, on the other hand, to assert our creativity and to shape situations that we can shape, as we are doing currently with our climate, that is also sin. We call it a sin of om omission, if you like, or maybe it's a sin of emission. <coughs> but this is, this is what it's like to just say, well, I'm not going to exercise the creativity I have to shape policy, to shape, uh, to invent new things. I'm just, you know, you can't expect the cow to worry about how much methane she's putting out. Why do you expect me to worry about how much carbon is coming out of the back of my car? Created creativity, very difficult. And in that lies this fundamental sense we have of a struggle. And we call it original sin. It's not, not because we're putting the blame on those two people way back when. But it's something about the human situation that we know we live in this, in this very conflicted space. And we know, above all, that we have a tendency to distrust the voice of God. We have a tendency to think God has ulterior motives. Now, original sin is one of the, one of the things which uh, doesn't really fly uh, in Muslim-Christian relations. Muslims are very often critical of, of Christians for the doctrine of original sin. And I think not without reason, because the way most Christians talk about original sin, basically, we are paying off somebody else's debt. You know, it's their fault, and we're lumbered with it. And of course, you, you add to that the notion that all this is being paid off by Jesus, then the, the thing just seems even more ridiculous to Muslims. 
God does not force one person to pay off another's debt. You're responsible for your own debts. So the story of uh, the first parents, Adam and his wife, in the Quran is slightly different. I gave you two versions. There's, there are seven versions in the Quran of the creation of, of the human beings and Iblis. Uh, the word Iblis, the name Iblis really is, again, it, it's like Injil. It comes from the Greek originally, Diabolos. Uh, So I've got, you've got the full text there, but I'm, I'm cutting and pasting a bit here. <clears throat> when your Lord told the angels, I'm putting a successor on earth, the word successor is caliph, uh, a word we, we hear a lot these days. I am creating a successor on earth, a caliph on earth. The angel said, how can you put someone there who will cause damage and bloodshed when we celebrate your praise and proclaim your holiness. That's what angels do. Angels don't have creativity. Uh, the Quran goes on. Uh, God says, I know things you don't. And there's a little more. Then in, in chapter 7, we established you on earth and provided you with a means of livelihood there. Small thanks you give. We created you, we gave you shape, and then we said to the angels, bow down before Adam. And they did, but not Iblis. He was not one of those who bowed down. God said to Iblis, what prevented you from bowing down as I commanded you? And he said, I'm better than him. You created me from fire and him from clay. God said, get down from, there, from here. This is no place for your arrogance. Get out, you're contemptible. But Iblis said, give me respite until the day people are raised from the dead. And God replied, you have respite. And then Iblis said, because you put me in the wrong, I will lie in wait for them. I will lie in wait for them all on your straight path. I'll come at them from their front and from their back, from their right and their left, and you will find most of them are ungrateful. God said, get out, you are disgraced and banished. I swear I shall fill hell with you and all who follow you. But, but Adam, you and your wife, Live in the garden, both of you. Eat whatever you like, but do not go near this tree or you will become wrongdoers. Satan whispered to them so as to expose their nakedness, which had been hidden from them. He said, your Lord only forbade you this tree to prevent your becoming angels or immortals. And he swore to them, I'm giving you sincere advice. He lured them with lies. So their nakedness became exposed to them and when they, when they had eaten from the tree they began to put together leaves from the garden to cover themselves. Their Lord called to them, did I not forbid you to approach that tree? Did I not warn you that Satan was your sworn enemy? They replied, our Lord we have wronged our souls. If you do not forgive us and have mercy we shall be lost. Then Adam received some words from his Lord and God accepted Adam's repentance. He is the ever relenting, the most merciful. We said, that is God said, get out all of you. But when guidance comes from me, as it certainly will, there will be no fear for those who follow my guidance, nor will they grieve. Those who disbelieve and deny our messages shall be the inhabitants of the fire and there they will remain. So you have a story in the Quran, in fact, various versions of the story, which in lots of ways are similar to the Genesis account. We, we recognize many of the, the aspects there. But like 
so many parts of the Quran uh, it reads more like a sermon it, it doesn't doesn't read as though it's telling telling the story from the beginning it's referring often to the story it doesn't give all the full details we don't, we're not told what kind of tree it is uh, we're not given God is referring to what he said some other time which is not actually in the Quran so the, the Quran is a voice within the the whole range of voices of the of the biblical tradition the Quran itself says that this is this is scripture like the other scriptures this is from the same source you recognize it this is not something foreign it's not claiming to be new it's simply claiming to come and to confirm and to set straight uh, what already existed but I wanted to uh, to draw attention to this one this verse 237 then Adam received some words from his Lord and God accepted his repentance <clears throat> it's done it's easy very often Muslims have said to me why do you Christians make this thing so complicated okay Adam and his wife he, she's not given a name in the Quran Adam and his wife it's, it's only Mary who's given an the only woman given a name in the Quran uh, Adam and his wife did something wrong they slipped up Satan tempted them they did something wrong they realized that you know if they didn't repent and and if God didn't forgive them they were lost so they they asked repentance and God forgave them and it's all done God is great God is merciful why do you Christians go on with this whole business about the need for a savior and the, the need for a sacrifice and on and on and on you go and you've got this system and he has to do this and there has to be a man and has to be God and God. why do you do that cannot God forgive and so the what we would call in in the Christian tradition the the mysterious nature of of our fundamental sin is somehow glossed over I think uh, I think Muslims would say the same thing they would say sin is not terribly mysterious it's sin is disobedience you disobey because for the same reason as in the Christian tradition you trust the voice of the one who tells you God is trying to cheat you out of something but if you like the difference uh, in, our, in our approaches to this is uh, from the Christian side we see this as something fairly fundamental to to the human person and it continues on not because not because we've inherited it like Augustine thought necessarily uh, as though it were DNA but because that's how we all know we are and that's how our cultures have developed we're all immersed in this from the time the time we grow up we are immersed in cultures which tell us we should not have limits placed on us we're immersed in cultures which tell us God is unpredictable God hides things God is is controlling God is testing God will you'll never know what God's up to we are immersed in cultures who tell us that we cannot trust the word of God which simply says to us be fruitful multiply come for a walk in the garden with me in the cool of evening be my friend love me allow yourself to be loved something about us doesn't want to trust that voice in the Islamic tradition of course Muslims know very well that human beings tend towards sin uh, the Quran talks about a nafs which uh, commands to evil there's, there's some kind of self in us a lower self they sometimes say which pushes us towards doing evil so we're both in this in this situation of recognizing human evil but it's the mechanism of forgiveness uh, that distinguishes us I think it's not simply a case of saying gee I'm sorry that was bad 
I realize that, uh, that I disobeyed you, but I'll never do it again. Oh, okay, says God, done. That's perhaps a, a caricature of the situation, but, but it's often been, been put to me in, that, in those uh, kind of words. What are we saying is going on uh, when we say that our sin needs more? What are we saying is going on when we recognize that we need a savior? We haven't simply got within us, we don't sense we have within us what it takes to get us out of this. We're, we're stuck. We're stuck in this uh, ongoing suspicious relationship with God, this twisted relationship with God where we don't trust God those of you who know James Allison's work that draws on, on uh, René Girard, really very important in, in exploring uh, this notion of original sin, a wonderful book which I recommend to you, uh, The Joy of Being Wrong, quite a title. But I, I, I mentioned one of those things last night that, uh, that James speaks about. Uh, in response to the question from the lady down there about, about forgiveness uh, and the mea culpa. And, and James points out that Paul's, Paul's fundamental, uh, you know, the reason why we take original sin so much more seriously than Jews who read the, who read the same text of Genesis and they say to us, what on earth are you people up to? I mean, we've got the same text. Why do you see in there something as complex and as, as naughty as original sin? We've been reading the same text for, for thousands of years. You're creating something that's not there. And Muslims say to us the same thing. You've, you've created something which is really not there. God can forgive like that. But what, what James Allison points out is the Paul's experience on the Damascus Road has very much shaped us. Not because it's an experience fundamentally of guilt, but it's an experience fundamentally of forgiveness, of being forgiven even while he's on the road to Damascus to see to the, the persecution of more Christians. Even while he's in the very act of going there with letters to make sure that they're all arrested and killed and so on. Even then, right at that moment, when in, this, in a sense he's most deeply in his denial of God, God reaches out to him in mercy and draws him into uh, a mission which has shaped our community, it's shaped the world. So that experience, in, in that moment, Paul sees just how, in, in the moment of being forgiven, he sees how incredible it is, the, the, the wrong that he is engaged in doing. And that, in a sense, is why, why we're so focused on it. It can go wrong, it can go bad, our focus on original sin. It can become just guilt, guilt, guilt. You'll never get out of this, you're really bad. You're so bad, you've always been bad. There's something about humanity which is just bad, bad, bad. It can go bad. But there's also something about the doctrine of original sin which is very liberating. It tells us the truth about who we are. It, it explains to us something uh, of the possibility of getting out of it. it because it, it, uh, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the story of their fall, the story of their, their hiding from God is something which uh, it, it holds up a mirror to us. And it holds up a mirror also to God. It holds, well not, not a mirror to God, it holds us uh, a lens if you like through which we can see God see the disappointment of God, hear the voice of God that is looking, that is calling to us in the cool of evening saying, let's just walk together. 
the doctrine of original sin, the knowing, the recognition of our somewhat twisted relationship with God that we've allowed ourselves to be drawn into, knowing that allows us to get out of it. Knowing that allows us to be drawn more into the trust of the voice of God. Knowing our conflicted relationship between our creatureliness and our creativity gives us an insight which will enable us to move forward. But in a sense, insight is not enough. That's why we, we talk so much about needing a savior. If insight were enough, if information were all we needed, then we'd be in a lot better position. You know, we could just get a book. And the book would tell us, oh, this is your trouble. And we say, oh, okay, fine. So now we know. Or we're just forgetful. The Quran's presentation of, of the human predicament has a couple, of, a couple of aspects to it, really. One is ignorance. We just don't know what is the good we ought to be doing. Or we're heedless and forgetful of what we ought to be doing. Heedless and forgetful of our obligations towards God and, and other human beings. But, and so that, that's, why, that's why prophecy is important, because prophets bring you knowledge. Prophets bring you guidance. That way you won't be lost anymore. But if we're honest, and this I think is, is where the New Testament is, is very strong, and Paul, again, uh, helps us out here, Paul has this wonderful passage where he, he's so frustrated. He says, I, I really don't understand myself. I know what it is I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't do it. And I know the kinds of things I'm not supposed to be doing, but I do them. It's not knowledge that's lacking. It's not that we need more laws. It's not that we need more directions, information. We've got tons. And again, to come back to the, uh, come back to the climate crisis, we're not lacking information. There's a huge supply, oversupply almost, of information about what is going on uh, with our climate. And yet somehow we, we still find ourselves, not everybody, but collectively, we still find ourselves paralyzed. We still find ourselves outraged that someone would even suggest that we need to do something about this. Knowledge will not help us because there is something fundamentally amiss with us. There's some inability to hold together our creativity and our createdness. And so, you could say that uh, what we've done is taken over the process of creation, the process of our own creation, and we've shut it down. This is what Adam and Eve do in the story. God is looking for an ongoing relationship with them, this is not as though creation is done and then they're on their own. No, this is, a, this is about a relationship that continues on. But what do Adam and Eve do? They say, no, we are taking over the process. We will be God, thank you very much. Uh, we will take the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We will decide what is good and evil. And then we will be responsible for the process of our own creation. And in the end, what they've done is shut it down. Why do we need a savior? Why do we need someone who will break through that block that we have, that we have created for ourselves? Not because there's a, there's a bloodthirsty God who wants to see a sacrifice. Not because there's a God who stands on his dignity and insists on seeing blood 
insists on somebody paying the price, not because God plays the kind of games that we play in our politics, taking hostages, uh, inflicting, inflicting damage on other people to play, to negotiate what's going on. This is not God doing something to somebody else. This is God doing something God's self. This is God acting out in a human life what it means really to be human, what it means to be both creative and creature. This is God restarting, if you like, the process of creation. And we have the choice. We can get into that. We can be, as Paul says, in Christ. Or if you prefer, you can be in Adam. These are, these are Paul's two, two great categories, in Christ or in Adam. In the old Adam, where you are struggling with God, where you don't trust God, where you prefer to be your own creator, however much of a mess you make of it, where you refuse your responsibility for the rest of creation, where you refuse your insertedness in the rest of the universe. Or you can be in Christ, where the divine and the human are united in a way in which there is no struggle, where the divine and the human are completely in sync, where the human resonates utterly with the word that is God. Take your pick. Do you want to be in Adam? Or do you want to be in Christ? This is, this is the point where uh, I think in many respects there's, there's a certainly a surface distinction between what Muslims and Christians say about the human person. But I think at the same time, uh, it's probably fair to say that uh, many Muslims also, and we see it in, in, many, uh, in many texts of the Islamic tradition, have that same sense that we witness uh, in Paul. They, they have that sense because it's a human it's a human experience. Yes, you can have official doctrines which right from the beginning are in a sense critiquing Christianity because Islam begins, I think it's fair to say, as a reform movement in which the prophet is trying to reform uh, what Christians and Jews have, uh, have lost of the, the truth of the Abrahamic tradition. It's not it's not a tradition that seeks to go beyond Christianity and Judaism, but it's a tradition which seeks to return to the pure, simple faith of Abraham. So at, right at the beginning, you've got this kind of argument going on. Christians, Christians are saying this about sin and salvation, and uh, the Quran and the Prophet reject various aspects of that and taking that rejection seriously, that, that perplexity about, about our doctrine seriously, uh, gives us an opportunity to rethink the doctrine and not to throw it over, but to, to ask ourselves, what is it really getting at? What are, the, what are the things that we might have implied about God by our theology, which are unjust towards God? And, and there are plenty of them. So, as a reform movement, Islam does us a great service because it, it presses us on the key points of the Christian tradition and asks us to, to rethink. And many people will rethink and they say, yes, you're absolutely right, and they become Muslim. And other people rethink and they say, yes, you're absolutely right, and they they say, well, I, I'm still a Christian, but yes, I, I don't believe in the Trinity, and you're right about original sin, and yes, that whole business about a savior, that's, you know. Uh, but my own experience is that by taking seriously the critique, 
uh, and entering more, more deeply into these key mysteries of the Christian tradition, particularly the Trinity, Incarnation, Atonement, and so on, uh, one can find uh, the rich kernel that's there that sometimes has got lost to us in, in the, the catechism of the years in which we've oversimplified this and oversimplified that and uh, forgotten all the buts and the bits in brackets and the footnotes and so on. And we've come up with a very oversimplified structure to our faith. So the word in Eden, uh, the discordant word, is the word which is uh, somehow, we don't know where it's from, but it's there, we recognize it. There's the word which says to us, which whispers to us almost, don't trust God's word. God is trying to cheat you out of something. And our believing that word has substantially shaped our world. And it's only by abandoning that belief that God is trying to cheat us out of something, that God is playing games with us, that God is manipulating us, and simply trying to hear, to resonate with the word of God, which calls us to walk in the cool of evening, which tells us to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to be alive. Only when we hear that word do we really come to life. And we hear that word most clearly, I think, in the word made flesh.